science-haters, welcome to today's grade 12 Life Sciences show. Today we have a special revision lesson on genetics. We have selected highlights from lessons shown earlier in the year to help you with your revision. Please send us your questions and comments on Facebook on facebook.com forward slash learn extra or on Twitter at learn extra so we can help you revise. Don't forget to download today's show notes on learn.mindset.co.za or you can click on the link on our Facebook page. Now it's time to get on with today's lesson. Let's go straight to the question then. A plant with red flowers is crossed with a plant with white flowers. Okay? Let's get another <coughs> color. Red flowers. Notice what I'm doing. I'm underlining the keywords. This is your homework before you answer the question. Or you can make notes on the side of the question. All the seeds, when grown, produce plants with red flowers. Assuming that the flower color is controlled by a single pair of alleles, which allele is dominant and which is recessive? Now we're testing your knowledge on whether you know what is dominant and recessive. If red was mated with white and all were red, what does it tell you which is the stronger one? Obvious, it's going to be red. Red is dominant and white is recessive. 1.2, if a dominant allele for tall plants, dominant allele for tall plants, is represented by the letter D. What letter should represent the corresponding recessive allele? Remember, dominant, uppercase, recessive, same letter, lowercase. And therefore, your answer would be small d. 1.3. Distinguish between the terms homozygous and heterozygous. And we've done this before, so we're going to just show it to you on the screen. Homozygous having identical alleles at the same locus on both members of a pair of homologous chromosomes. One from your mother, one from your father. On both of those, the alleles are identical. If they're coding for blue eyes, they must both be coding for blue eyes. Heterozygous having, only one word is changing here, different. Having different alleles at the same locus. Remember, the rest of the sentence is the same. Don't learn the thing twice. One is same, one is different. 1.4. Explain why Mendel chose pea plants for his investigation on inheritance. Now, this is history. You needed to read about it, and it doesn't change. It's not a higher level. It's straightforward recall. Why did he use pea, plant, pea plants? And the reason was they were cheap, and they were easy to grow, easy to cultivate. Also, they have easily discernible characteristics or traits. What does that mean? They're either or. It's not tall, medium, short. It's tall or short, white or purple, nothing in between. So it was easy to do. They grow fast. So he could have multiple generations in a short space of time. And this improves the reliability of his results. Remember, increasing sample size. Right? And many seeds are formed at a time. Again, the sample size is also uh, increased there. They are easily self and cross-pollinated. How did he ensure how did he ensure that the plants were true breeding? And that's straightforward. First, he allowed the plants to self-pollinate for many generations. Only those that were true breeding. Now, how will he know that they're true breeding? He will know that they're true breeding, that if he took red plants with red flowers and they kept breeding them among themselves, that all the generations only showed red. And he took white and only white came out there. All right? or purple, or whatever color that you're talking about. That's what, in this case, it's not red, right? It's purple and white. Then, he took these plants, and he cross-pollinated the flowers himself. And why could he do this? It's because the pea plant has a closed flower. Normally, it self-pollinates, because no insect or other vector can get any pollen in. So what he could do, he could open the flower and dust off pollen from one plant to the other. He could self-pollinate it. How did he ensure that his results were reliable? I asked that just now. It's obvious. He used a big sample. He didn't do one and two plants. He did many plants. And he repeated the experiment several times. Remember, reliability increases with a bigger sample and by repeating the investigation. Because reliable means that if anybody else does the experiment, they must get the same result. 
This is reliability. That means if we repeat, we must get the same result. Validity, on the other hand, is talking about the method. If the method is correct, what is kept constant, etc. We didn't let anything else interfere. Our results recorded properly, etc. Good. We move on to number two. Gregor Mendel uh, experiments with pea plants to study inheritance of four plants, seed shape, whatever. For each trait, he crossed homozygous tall plants with homozygous dwarf plants. The offspring obtained in the F1 generation were then interbred to form the F2, what we've been talking all the time. He did the same for each of the other trays. The results obtained for the F2 generation are shown in the table. So after he has done his work, this is the result that he found. Plant height, tall, whatever, this, that, whatever, it's given you figures here. Okay? And it gives you a ratio on the other side. And you'll notice that two are not completed. X and Y. Good. So you've read the passage. What is the expected phenotype ratio for a tray involving two heterozygous plants? If we take any two heterozygous plants and we want to know what is the result going to be, you can predict it. It will always be more or less 3 is to 1. 3 of the dominant and 1 of the recessive. From the extract, from the results, Calculate X and Y. Also states which prove, uh, ra tray provided a ratio closest to the expect. Here's your expected, your three is to one. Right? Show all working. Simple. I'm not going to go into the calculations. We, you can do this on your own. For seed shape, these were the figures that were there. 5474 over 1850 of the recessive one. So it came to 2,96 is to 1, ratio, 2,96 is to 1, not a fraction, a ratio, okay? Not a proportion that of so many, this was there. This is a ratio. When you are comparing two, how are they comparing in the whole? Then we had Y, seed color, 6022 over 2001, and the answer came to 3,01 to 1. Our answer is 3 is to 1. So which one is closer? Obviously, is the one that says 3,01 to 1 is closer. So closest seed color, 3,01 to 1. That's how you answer that question. Now the question goes further. Give a possible reason why the ratio selected in question 2.2 was closest to the theoretical. Now let's go back to the to figures that are given. Look at the figures, 5474 and 1850. Here you got 6022 and 2001. <coughs> there was a bigger sample used here, so therefore that is one possible reason why it was closer. It has a larger sample size. This is now testing you your reliability. The, the closer to the answer, the more reliable it's going to be, obviously, isn't it? Using the results, state whether the allele for round seed or wrinkle seeds is dominant. And you would have seen the results, and your answer would obviously be around the seeds. State two factors that Mendel controlled during these breeding experiments. And just now, we, we asked some questions about it, and it's coming back to bite you now. First of all, he had to make sure that when he started with his plants, they must be true breeding, homozygous, in P1. And in the second stage, when you're getting the second ratio, the plants had to be heterozygous. You can't take a heterozygous plant and cross it with a homozygous plant. You're going to have problems. You're not going to get the same ratio. Your whole problem changes, or rather your result changes. Write down Mendel's law of segregation. Now, simply asking you a simple, straightforward question, write down this law of segregation. And what did Mendel's law of segregation say? It said that during gamete formation, Remember, he didn't say it exactly like this. We are now saying it in terms of our knowledge of meiosis and the rest of it. During gamete formation, members of each allele pair, remember during, in normally in your body, these allele pairs are lying next to each other in homologous chromosomes. But when gametes form, the members of each of these allele pairs separate 
so that each a gamete will only have one allele for a particular trait. Remember Mendel's first, he said something to the effect that for every characteristic, there are two factors that bring about that characteristic. In today's time, we are saying for every characteristic in your body or in every cell, there are two alleles that control that particular characteristic. In an adult, both are found. But in the sperm and in the egg, in gametes, only one of a pair is found in there. Why? Because meiosis ensured that those chromosomes split and they moved to opposite poles. So when the cells formed, they had half the chromosome number, and therefore in that half, you could have only had one of those two alleles. The other one is with the, with the, other, uh, with the other chromosome or the other sperm or egg. Good? A sheep homozygous for white wool are crossed with sheep homozygous for black wool. All the offspring are white. What does that tell you guys? Let's do homework now. Sheep homozygous for white. They are homozygous, that's homework, and white wool. They are crossed with sheep homozygous and black. So we know that both the sheep are homozygous. And one is white and one is black. When they cross, all the offspring are white. You have to ask your question, now ask yourself the question, which is dominant? Obviously, if we put homozygous white and homozygous black, and if all the offspring are white, that means white is dominant. So this is the homework you're doing while you're working out this problem. Use the letters B and B to represent a genetic cross to show the results and show the expected results if the F1 were to interbreed. So already you know for white, it's capital B, and for black, it's small b. And because the question said homozygous, you're going to have capital B, capital B, and small b, small b for your starting point. Can you understand my drive in getting you to understand the concept of doing homework before you answer the question? It's very easy. Just go and answer the question. But you don't separate homozygous dominant, homozygous recessive, genotype, phenotype. You need to use the terminology to write these little notes while on the question paper while you are busy reading this information. Don't wait to read the whole thing. As you're going along, underline, write the symbol for it, etc., and you get it done that way. Especially when they give you longer case studies, guys. It's a lot of information, and you can get confused in between. I think it's time for a break now, so go do a few stretches, take a deep breath, but don't go too far, because we'll be right back. Welcome back, Mindsetters. Today we are doing revision. Even though we have selected highlights from previous shows, you can still follow me on Twitter, at Learn Extra, or post or comment on Facebook on facebook.com forward slash Learn Extra. So the first question then, straight away. Uh, uh, we started, I told you, with uh, uh, complete dominance so that we can get used to it again and we move on from there. A boy's mother has a patch of white hair called white forelock. which is caused by a dominant allele H. Notice I told you last week the homework I'm doing. You could either scribble this on the side, the keywords, or you could be underlying it on the question paper. The mother is heterozygous, very important, for the strain. Immediately you can write it down, H, H. Why? Because it's heterozygous, hetero, different allele. His father does not have white forelock. White forelock was caused again by a dominant allele. So if his father does not have white forelock, that means his father has to be homozygous recessive. Notice the homework we're doing before we start answering this question. Represent a genetic cross to determine the possible genotypes and phenotypes of the children. So without this, you can't start the question. So you had to do that homework. That's why I'm showing you how to do that. Now let's look at the answer. So what are we doing here? Again, remember the, for, uh, the, the format. You have to write P1 there. Phenotype. Father had no white forelock. Mother had white forelock. Genotype under that. Father is homozygous recessive. Mother is heterozygous. They told you this in the question. They didn't tell you he's homozygous here. They didn't have to tell you. Because why no white forelock is recessive, so that means when the cat is away, the mice is played. There's no cat here. There's two small letter H's. Good? Then gametes, all we're doing, we're taking this guy and we're separating them. 
and we're taking that guy and we're separating them. Why? Because we are saying that when meiosis takes place during gametogenesis, each sperm or each egg can have only one form of this gene. In other words, only one allele from the pair. Why? Because meiosis has caused the chromosome number to become half. So half the chromosome will be in some of the cells, half on the other cells. So this is what we're going to get. Okay? Thereafter, fertilization takes place. And when fertilization takes place, we have this situation here. We're using a Punnett square. We could have used a line diagram like this, giving you that, like this, giving you that. Uh, where are we? Yeah. Or we could have gone with this guy there and there. Now you notice why I discourage you from using line diagrams because you can get confused and some people may even join the one gamete with the, uh, with the same gamete and that's no good because the males will be fe fertilizing eggs and not that. So the Punnett square works better in this way. So we put our gametes. I say keep this rule. Whatever is on the left, keep it on the left. Remember, you can switch it around, but this is for your own sanity and for your own confidence when you're doing this problem. Whatever is on the left, keep it on the left. Whatever is on the right, keep it on the right. And in this case, right is on top. And then all you're doing, you're saying this H and that H, you're getting a heterozygous there. That one and that one, you're getting homozygous. That one and that one, heterozygous. That one and that one, homozygous. So what have we come now? So we write the word F1 here. Remember, for meiosis and fertilization, there's one mark. And for P1 and F1, you're getting another one mark. <coughs> so even if your answer was wrong out of six, you would get two out of six if you follow the format. This is how important the format is. Get used to using the format for all your problems. This is why we're putting it here, OK? Uh, so at the bottom, we're going to write there also, phenotype, two without white forelock, and two with white forelock. Two is to two, or we can say one is to one in the end also. And our genotype uh, ratio, what's our genotype ratio? 50% hetero is to 50% homo, recessive. Now, here, why am I using percentage here? I'm only using for percentage to show you we can show it as a percentage. We can also show that as one uh, is to one. One heterozygous is to one homozygous recessive. It's not necessary to show it as a percentage, but if the question asks you to show a percentage ratio, then you have to use percentage. Good. What type of dominance is illustrated in this cross? I gave it away in the start. I told you I'm dealing with complete dominance because the one completely dominates over the other. When that capital letter, when that allele for white forelock is there, the child will have this white forelock. While I'm talking about this, I'm thinking of my good friend, Ziad Aswat in Denmark, because he, from young, had the white forelock. So now I'm trying to put that into my perspective that that's why he had the white forelock. Okay, but anyway, Ziad, if you're listening to me in Denmark, I doubt it anyway. Let's not talk to him. <laughs> rabbits with brown fur were crossed with rabbits with white fur color. Now, notice there's a slight difference already in the way the problem is presented. What have they done here? They're saying rabbits with brown fur, capital B, were crossed with rabbits with white fur, capital W. Look at the homework again. The minute they're using two capital letters, that must tell us already, hello, hello. This is not complete <coughs> dominance. It can either be incomplete or yeah, co-dominance. You got it. Right. All the resultant offspring in this case were cream. I told you to differentiate between incomplete and co, you look at the offspring. If the offspring are both, or in this case, black and brown, then it's co-dominance. However, in this case, it's cream. Under original problem, we didn't, the parents, we didn't talk about cream. So cream is an intermediate. It's a blend, new, new one. So already we must know that this is incomplete dominant. But notice, guys, when you're working out the problem, the way you work out the problem does not change. You are now using only capital letters and capital letters. But the way we work out genotype, phenotype, game meets, F1, all that, is still the same. But the results are different. Let's see why. 
I want this to sink into your head to know that genetics is easy. And I'm saying this specifically for my own daughter, Yasira, who I overheard telling her sister yesterday that it's very difficult, this genetics. And her father is sitting there that's here broadcasting to the whole country and she can't get genetics right. So to Yasira, catch her wake up, genetics is easy. Okay? Now, let's look at this. P1, again, the format is the same. What are we doing? The parent was a brown and white in this case. I said black earlier, sorry, my mistake. Brown and white, okay? Capital B, capital B, capital W, capital W. Because it's incomplete dominance, they don't have to tell you it's homozygous. If they tell you that these two parents gave you cream, you can't have it any other way, okay? All the offspring. They, if they had to say a portion were cream, then you have to start thinking about it because heterozygous can also give you that situation. But in this case, they tell you all were cream. All were cream can only come from this combination, okay? Our meiosis again, and we separate the gametes, and we have the Panna square there. Whatever is on the left is on the left. Whatever is on the right is on the right on top there. And obviously, because we got only B on the side and only W on the side, all our offspring will be BW, BW, BW. But what did the question say? F1 and F2 generation. And six marks, they cheated you there. We can't give you six marks for two, but this I put deliberately so we can go to the next stage. Okay? So that is your first stage. They're all going to be that way. So all will be cream, 100% cream. Now, for the F2, what do we do? Now we don't write F1 here. Yeah, I've written F1. I'm going to get one minus mark there. So we start here with not P1, but with P2. And this must obviously become F2. Please understand that when you do the second generation, you can't use P1 and P, uh, F1. You have to change it to P2 and F2. Second parents and second filial generation. Okay, so we start off with the genotype, phenotype. Both are cream. And our genotype, BW, BW. Game meets, same story, we're separating them only. And whatever is on the left, you keep them on the left. Whatever is on the right, you keep them on the right. That and that, now we're going to have to work it out. That one was easy. B, B, there you got capital B, capital B. That one and that one give you capital B, capital W. Capital B, capital W. And lastly, W, W. Notice whether you write capital B first and W or W, capital B. It's the same thing. They're still going to be cream. It's not going to make a difference. Okay? Now, what we have here now. Look at the genotype. We have one homozygous brown, two heterozygous, and one homozygous white. That's what we got there. And the phenotype, one brown is to two cream is to two one white. Now, if you remember, when we did a heterozygous cross last week in complete dominance, our genotype ratio was one is to two is to one. Here, the phenotype is one is to two is to one, and the genotype is one is to two is to one. In our heterozygous complete dominance, we had the answer 75 to 1 or 3 is to 1 in the phenotype. Here, the genotype and phenotype ratio is 1 is to 2 is to 1. Whether you work out a, in, an incomplete dominance or a co-dominance, your working out will be the same, but your phenotype won't be cream anymore. It will be, for example, in this case, one brown, two brown and white, and one white. Because co-dominance, both are showing in the offspring. So notice, once you learn this, you don't have to now study co-dominance separately. The way you work it out, it's still with capital letters. You're still going to get the ratio 1 is to 2 is to 1, 1 is to 2 is to 1. You are only going to have a different result in the phenotype. The two will not be a new blend, but it will be both characteristics coming up there. Good. What type of dominance is illustrated here? Provide a reason. I already gave you that. In this case, it's incomplete because neither of the alleles is dominant and produce offspring which show an intermediate form. There's two parts to that answer. One is neither uh, is dominant and the second thing is the intermediate form of the characteristic. In an experiment to show co-dominance, plants with white flowers were crossed with, they're already telling you this is co-dominance, with plants with red flowers. All the offspring in the F1 generation have red flowers with white spots. Notice the difference now. The F1 offspring were interbred. The results of the cross between the F1 and o F uh, are shown here. So in other words, we took these red W, red W. 
trade W, RW, RW. Okay? And we crossed them and we got this. Now they're giving you numbers. Ah, now they're confusing us here. What the hell is going on here? They're saying there were 210, 420, and 210 white. Already, just by those numbers, you can see that that's 1 is to 1, and that's times 2. 420, 210 times 2 gives you that. So your ratio is 1 is to 2 is to 1. Immediately, you could pick that up because the last two numbers are the same. All right? So the first question shows the genotypes of all the varieties shown in this table. What are the genotypes of these organisms? They told you the phenotype, what? Red and white spots. Now they want to know what is the genotype. That's obvious and easy. For red, it will be RR, capital R, capital R. For white, it will be WW. And for red with white spots, it will be RW. Simple. Three marks for that. Then they're saying, give the ratio of the different phenotypes, which I worked out for you already, and that is 1 is to 2 is to 1. And last, they say, use, sorry, use the data in the table to draw a pie chart to illustrate the proportions of the different genotypes. Now, for the pie chart, remember, because you are dealing with a circle, and the circle, sorry, the circle, the angle is 360 degrees, you have to work out these things, as ratios or percentages of that. And you will find that you come to this conclusion. You'll show the calculations. Remember, you must show the calculations. This one is a very easy one, so you don't have to go into the details because it's showing you that the, 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 the two small ratios are one is to one, and the other one is double of that. So in other words, half of the circle must be of the one, and the other half must be divided into two for each of the other two. One is to two, one, one, one is to two, is to one. That's how we got to this one here. Obviously, you work with numbers, you can work at them out as percentage. If percentages are given to you, you can work out the angles, and if you're working out the angles, you're gonna take your, uh, say for example, it's 20%, then you're gonna say 360, times 20 over 100, and you're going to get an answer here. 20% here, 36, 72, obviously, you'll be 72 degrees. You must have a protector, you must have a compass, and you must have a sharp pencil to do this exercise. And that is how you will show this proportion in this particular, and you must have a title, obviously, guys. The proportions of different genotypes for flower color. And you have to either shade them like this, or you label them, WW, RR, and RW. Sometimes they ask you also to put the percentages inside. So you will put the percentages of this. This is 50%, obviously, and this will be 25%, and this will be 25% of that whole ratio. One is to two is to one, so 50%, and the other two are divided into two segments of 25%. Are we happy with that, guys? I'm hoping so. Right? Uh, by the way, we also have normally uh, a rubric that goes with this, and consult a memo that you have with you to see how marks are allocated for graphs. Notice in the past, graphs were about 13 marks. They went to 9, 11, and 9, and now the standard is between 6 and 8 marks, depending on the complexity of the graph, etc. Right, the karyotype below is that of a male person with a genetic disorder called Klinefelter syndrome. Ah, why you asked me Klinefelter syndrome? We didn't do it in school, sir. Right, don't get too panicky. You just see what the questions are asking you, if they're asking you something that you can't answer. All right, let's see. So they're giving you the diagram. I told you for each one we must have one, 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 one. Okay, so here what's happening. There's it, one, those are autosomes. All the autosomes are fine. All the autosomes are fine. Again, your homework. You're looking at the diagram. But you come to 23, there's supposed to be two there, and what do we see? One, two, three. And we notice that two are of the same size, and the other one is of a smaller size. So in other words, this human being is XXY. You either XX or you XY. This one is XXY. So this is a problem. Okay? So that was the first thing there. Provide the numbers of chromosomes which are autosomes and that that are gonosomes. And we've done that already for you. Chromosomes number 1 to 22 are autosomes, and number 23 is the gonosome. So we need to know that. State one visible difference between the karyotype above and the karyotype of a normal male. I showed it to you just now. The normal male has a karyotype, has X and Y chromosome. 
at number 23. Klinefelter syndrome character has an extra chromosome or three chromosomes at number 23, 2X and 1Y. So you are just telling us what you're seeing in this diagram. You didn't have to be a rocket scientist, neither did you have to study Klinefelter syndrome to answer this question. Okay, and the last one, use your knowledge of meiosis to explain how Klinefelter syndrome could have resulted. Now this question is not about Klinefelter, it's about the uh, meiosis. And what do we do there? We talk about non-disjunction. Let's move on, guys. We, we don't have much time. We're having so much of fun. Time is just running against us. So let's carry on with question three. We've answered only two questions so far. They were longer questions, and they needed explanation, so therefore we took a bit longer with them. The table below shows the percentage distribution of blood groups in a province in South Africa. There's a blood groups, blood group A, 35, uh, 15, 10, 40, okay? They've given you that 40, that's 50, 100, 50 plus 50, 100. How many genes control the blood group shown above? Now notice they didn't say how many alleles, they said how many genes. There is one, A, B, and O are simply different alleles of the same gene. So it's one, uh, it should have been one mark anyway there, right? Or explain your answer, sorry, you had to talk about that, so you, that's why you're getting three marks there. Explain how it is genetically possible to have four blood groups in a population. How do you get four gr blood groups out of that? Obviously. Blood groups are controlled by three alleles, that is IA, IB, and small i, this should be, sorry, this should be small i, no? which when in combination provide four phenotypes, that is blood group A, blood group AB, blood group B, and blood group O. So first of all, you must tell them that there are three alleles that control blood groups. And when they are combined, you name them obviously, and when they are combined, they give us these four types of blood groups. And also, we can even talk about the fact that it's complete and incomplete uh, and co-dominant. The complete dominance gives us blood group A and B, and uh, the co-dominance gives us blood group A, B. And obviously, we get O from the complete for recessive. Use a genetic diagram to illustrate how a man with blood group A and a woman with blood group B can have a child with blood group AB. Assume that both parents are homozygous. Homework. Notice the homework. Please, guys, I need you to concentrate on the homework part. What am I underlining? Why am I underlining that? Because those are the clues to work out the problem. And how do we work out this problem? There we go. So again, same story. Look at what has happened. We have not changed the format. We have kept the format the same. We have only changed the symbols. I told you in blood group, we have to use capital I and small i. Let's see how we do it. P1 phenotype A and B. Oops. Okay. Genotype, we said they both parents are homozygous. So it's IA, IA, IB, IB. Meiosis takes place, and there we have our, our gametes. We separate them, IA, IA, IB, IB. And when we put them together, whatever is on the left, on the left, whatever is on the right, is on the right. And when we combine them, we can only get AB. And our genotype, IA, IB, 100% phenotype, uh, a, B. See, I put white there. This is from a, another format I used here, okay? It should be A, B. All right? That's as easy as it is to work out a blood group. But now, sometimes it becomes a little compl uh, complicated when they tell you that there was this mother has blood group A and the child is blood group O and the father uh, is blood group B and there was a mix-up at the hospital. Now you need to do more working out like this to get to the answer. This was straightforward. Good. Now we're moving to the pedigree diagram that I told you earlier about. Pedigree diagram of a family where some individuals have hemophilia. So that's the first thing. Hemophilia is a sex-linked disorder. By the way, the examiner is not obliged. He doesn't have to tell you it's sex-linked because you've studied hemophilia and color blindness. Those two you know are sex-linked. He can give you another sex-linked disease, but then he must tell you it's sex-linked because he won't ask you about that disease, but he will ask you how to work it out, and that's what's important in these cases. All right? Use X capital H for normal blood clotting and X small h for the hemophilia trait. Now, if you're working out a pedigree diagram when they're talking about sex linkage, the first thing you do in a diagram like this is for all the males, they're giving you a code here, Males are the squares and females are the circles. For all the males, you will write there X, Y. For all the females, you're going to write X, X. And so you're going to go on.
That's the first thing you must do. Remember when it's sex link, you have to use the letters X and Y in your answer. If you do not, then your answer is wrong. If it's not sex link, you cannot use X and Y. Remember that. Okay, so they're telling you that now. Right now, what they're telling you there, uh, male hemophiliac is uh, the, this is supposed to be slightly higher, I think. All right. Uh, hemophilia, sex, right, okay. So we're saying that this particular, what did I do here, X, Y, X, Y, no? Joseph, X, what did I do there? X, Y, yeah. My Ys are looking like Xs, sorry guys. Okay, so X, Y, and X, X are given there. So if Adam, in this case here, the, just look at the coding here first, please, guys. They're telling you the hemophiliac, uh, this is supposed to be higher there, right? So let's go back to it. They're telling you now, from the paragraph above, state the relationship between gender and the incidence of hemophilia. What can you see here in the blocks? Male, 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 they all have hemophilia. So what's the problem there? It tells you that the incidence of hemophilia are greater in males than in females. Okay? In this case, it's only in the males. Write down all the possible genotypes of A, B, C, and whatever there, right? Okay? So A, B, and C, they're not given there. Let's look at that. X, H, Y, that's the first the one there on top. X, H, Y. Why? Because he has the hemophilia trait, so he must have the small H. These ones here are normal, so they can either be X, H, H or X, H, H, or with a small h. Now the problem is, because they're normal, how can we determine it? Now remember that the son does not get the X chromosome from the father. He gets it from the mother. So if this child is hemophiliac, that means he has the small h. He didn't, uh, sorry, X, H, Y. Right? Now this X, he did not get from his father. So therefore, this X had to come from this mother. So we cancel that out. This mother had to be a carrier. There's the answer there. This guy is normal, so he'll have a capital H and a Y. This female is normal, but where did she come from? She came from these two parents, and this father had the small one, so he had to give her the small one, and because she's normal, she got the normal one from her mother. This guy is an, another guy, we don't know his parents, so it's hard to say, but if we go to the children, we can maybe uh, get some answers. First of all, Daniel will get this small H from his mother, Sarah is normal, the father is normal, so he's going to give her normal there, that, or we can have that because it's not enough information, and the same goes there and there. So when we're looking at our, our answers, then we are looking at B. It will be X, H, small H, because the mother has to have that small one to give the son, and uh, the last one has X, H, Y, because he's normal male. It's time for a break, so go get some water and grab a snack, and we'll be here when you get back. Welcome back from the break. Remember, if you have any questions, you can submit them to the Learn Extra Help Desk. You'll find the details pinned to the top of the page. Right now, let's do some more revision. About 70% of Americans, they say, get a bitter taste. I'm not reading the whole story there. It is tasteless to the rest. So that means 70% of the people, they're getting this taste, this bitter taste. The other, the 30% of the population, they, they're not getting this taste, tasteless. Can you see the homework? Keywords? Good. Right. The taster, Elil, is dominant. Another homework. So already we can put in our head, taster has to do with capital T. To non-taster, and obviously a non-taster will have a small letter T. Homework. Also, normal skin pigmentation is dominant to albino. Normal skin is dominant to an albino. A normally pigmented woman, all right, now, remember we're saying that normal skin is 
If we use that, we could use N, we could use any other letter, whatever, capital N, small n, whatever we want to use, capital S, small s. It's not very nice to use capital S and small s because they look too similar and it can cause problems. So let's take that one out. All right, but we'll come to our problem just now. A normally pigmented woman, now we are dealing with the problem. First, they gave you some background. Now they're saying, a normally pigmented woman who is taste blind for PTC, taste blind. So we know for this already she has to be small t, small t, because tasteless is recessive. And recessive can only show itself if they are in the homozygous state. Good? And uh, a woman who is taste blind for PTC has an albino taster father. Now, if the father uh, was uh, an albino and he was a taster, we need to start asking a question. Uh, let's use the word, uh, let's use the letters uh, A and A, right? Capital A for normal and small a for albino, okay? Now, the father, that means was a a small a small a and he was a taster so he had to have a capital t but let's go to the daughter a normally pigmented woman who is taste blind for ptc she is taste blind that means she got two small t's where did she get these two small t's she had to get one from the father and one from the mother so therefore this father could not be homozygous for this condition he had to be heterozygous for this condition, because he had to have the allele for this albino, all right? And uh, as an albino, taste the father. So, and his albino, that is recessive, because normal is dominant to albino. She marries an albino man. She marries an albino man who is a taster. Though the man's mother is a non-taster. So the albino man, who is a taster, but his mother is a non-taster. That means his mother had small t, small t. So he would have got the capital T from the father, and he would have had to have the small t there. Can you see the homework, guys? And, and I'm, I'm not rushing this thing. I'm going through slowly so that you can see the homework that we are doing as we're going on. This is what your question paper should look like when you are reading this passage. You've got to be able to make these notes. From here, then only. No, what most of you do, you start with a problem. You haven't even identified what they're asking, and you go dive in without thinking. So let's see now. So they, they're taking about an albino man. That this is the guy, and now the lady who is normally pigmented, so she would have a capital A, isn't it? Because she's normal. But her father was an albino. So he would have had to give her a small a. So she had to be heterozygous for normal skin. At the same time, uh, what was she again? Normally pigmented, who is taste blind. She had to have that. So there's the daughter, and I mean the husband, and the, the, the wife. Oh, can't know what's happening. And the husband on the other side. So we have at least determined their genotypes. You cannot have a genotype that says A-T, A-T. Because what is this then? A-T, they're dealing with skin color and taste at the same time. Is that a tasteless skin? No, it can't be. The skin is either normal or albino. Taste is either tasteless or the person can taste. So these two things have to stay with each other because they are alleles of the same gene. So A's will go with A's and T's will go with T's. Are we clear with that? Good. Now we move on. So we start off by answering the question now. So we start off just like we would do in a monohybrid cross. We would start by saying P1, the parent, and the phenotype, the father is albino taster, and uh, the mother is normal pigmented. And, sorry, this ran away there. I thought it was something missing. This should go there, right? She's normal pigmented taste blind. Okay? And the father's genotype is albino 
This is the husband in this case. And he is a taster, but remember, his mother was a non-taster, so he would have had to have the small tea. And the lady, she's normal, and, pigment, uh, and she's, uh, what you call it, tasteless, tasteless, yeah. Good? I want to see my own work first. I may have to change what I just wrote there. A normal pigmented woman who stays down has an albino taster father. So we need to change this, and we're going to change it as we're going to go along. You're going to have to bear with me as we go along, because I'm going to change as we're going to go along, because I made a mistake on the original uh, story here. So she is, and again, this is why that homework I did is important. Can you see why it's important? Because I've realized just by looking at this that I already made a mistake. And she had to be heterozygous because of what I told you earlier. Let's see why. What did I tell you? She is a normal pigmented woman, right? So she had to have a capital A because normal is dominant. However, is she homozygous for the condition or is she heterozygous for this condition? How do we determine this? We need to look at her parents. Let's see what's the story there who is taste blind for people, has an albino taster father. Albino taster father. The father was an albino, so he could only give one of two small A's. So he had to be this one. I have got in a, in a solution that one. That's wrong. So we're going to collect it, correct it as we go along. Okay? So that is what's going to happen there. And we're going to have to change as we go along there. Now, when you're working a dihybrid cross, the problem is how do I work out the gametes? In a monohybrid cross, it was very easy. What did you do when you had a monohybrid cross? You simply said, if that was AA and this is AA, the game is you just had to separate these poikies. One, there, and AA. But here now we're having AA, TT, or AA, small t, small t. Now what do you do? So for this, I'm going to teach you how to do the gametes, and the way to do it is simple. You work a small monohybrid cross for each parent. So our parent, this was the one parent. What do we do for him? Let's see. Whatever is on the left, keep it on the left. Whatever is on the right, put it on top. A, 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 T, T. They separate. But in the gametes, each one is going to have different gametes. They're going to be single now. They're not going to be together. See what happens now. That's one. A, that T. That's another one. That's another one. That's another one. So all we've done is a small monohybrid cross there. I don't have to explain. But you need to know to work out the game meets for this section. That's the most important part. And to do that, you need to do a small monohybrid cross. And for the second parent, now here we're going to make that change. Remember, we had capital A, capital A. So we're going to change that capital A, the second one, to a small A. Okay? And therefore, our, our gametes will change there. Those two will be the same, obviously. And these two will change now. They will be uh, A, T, clock, clock, clock again, A, T. So those gametes change because of my discovery of the mistake that we made earlier. Are we happy there? Good. All right, now all we have to do, we've got two sets of gametes, four of those and four of these. We need to put them together to solve the problem. Let's see. That's just the first one. A capital T, A capital T, A small t, A small t. Remember, the order that you put these gametes is not going to make a difference because the number you're going to get is still the same. And this way now, we had... A capital T, the A small T, A small T, that one's there. And these ones must change now. So these ones must become A, T, A, T. Now notice everything thereafter is going to change. But let's see what we're doing. So these two rows will be easy because we don't have any change. So we'll do these two rows first. That and that will give you. Notice that although they were separate, when the fertilization takes place, they come back together. It's not anymore AT and AT. It's AA and TT. Uh, it doesn't sound so nice, do you? <laughs> <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> so we have capital A there, small a, and capital T, small t. I'm not going to go to each one because you, the skill is the same all around. That's why you see in a genetic cross, uh, monohybrid, you get one tick in the end. 
Why you get one tick? Because the skill you're using for all of those alternatives is the same. You're only getting one tick there. Okay, so all of these will be the same. Uh, not all. Those two will be the same, and these two will be the same. Why? Because this one has a small t, so you're getting a uh, homozygous there. Good? Now we go to the next one. This will be the, this one, this row, uh, this column, and that column will be the same, obviously, because look at the, the alternatives are the same. So all of these will be the same. And obviously all of those will be the same, but ours is wrong, so we need to correct it. Let's open it up first. Can you see if you make one mistake, how it can affect all the steps in your answer? Okay, so now what we're doing, we're going to correct what we're saying there. So if that's small a, so that will become small a. And that will become small a. Small a, small a, small a, small a, small a, and small a. So what has happened is we have homozygous, heterozygous, homozygous, heterozygous, and so on. Homozygous, 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 homozygous. That's what we have in this particular situation. Okay, and then we had to answer the question in terms of the ratios. Now, first of all, we're going to have now a hetero hetero. Can you see all of these are hetero hetero? These ones one, two, three, four. Okay, hetero hetero. What do I mean? The both characteristics the organism is heterozygous for it. Capital A small a, capital T small t. There's one, two. Three, four. This one? No. It can't be because that's homozygous, that's homozygous, that's homozygous, that's homozygous. Do we have any here? No, because all our uh, albinos will be homozygous. So we got four of those types. Then we have four of these types. That means hetero homo. Heterozygous, homozygous. Heterozygous, homozygous. Then on this side, we've got uh, another color, one, two, three, four, that are homozygous, heterozygous. That means the first condition, skin, is homozygous, but for tasting, they are heterozygous. And then we have homo, homo. Uh, we need another color. Homozygous, 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 homozygous. So what have we got here? Now our ratio changes. This, this answer has to change because we've got four, 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 four. All right? So in other words, our genotype ratio is four is to four is to four is to four, which becomes one is to one is to one if we simplify. Oh, and you've got to specify. You can't just write one is to one is to one. You're going to say one hetero hetero, okay? Two, uh, uh, what? the other one, one hetero homo, one Homo hetero and one homo homo. Recessive. That's how you have to answer that question. The phenotype, now you have to count again. What's the story here? These ones, one, two, three, four, are normal skin and tasters. These ones here are normal skin, normal skin and tasteless. I'm writing it there so that we can understand, right? Okay, and these ones here, the green ones, they are uh, albinos, but they still can taste. And the last lot, this one here, they are albinos and tasteless. So again, our ratio, let's see, non-taster, uh, albino taster, right? We got that one there. That's that one there, and non-taster there, right? Okay. So what we have is a situation of, again, the same ratio. One is to one is to one. Because they're all different in their phenotypes. Let's see why. What is this one? The pink, let's see. They are uh, normal skin tasters. They, these yellow ones here now, they are normal skin but tasteless. So one is to one because they're four is to four. Then this side here, we have albinos that are tasters. They are different from these two. So again... Four. So four is to four is to four. One is to one is to one. And the last one, they are albinos and tasteless. So all the four varieties of the uh, characteristics we have got in this particular problem. And that is how you answer that question. We've come to the end of today's show. 
Thanks for joining me and for chatting to me during the show. Remember to visit our website, learn.mindset.co.za, to download the show notes and to watch all the videos from this year's shows. Goodbye.